Welcome back to the factory. This week, we have a real-time clock module to show you. Of course, there's some jigs and we'll stretch PicoDev as far as we can. Let's do it. First thing I have to share with you this week is Brenton has been working on a real-time clock module with a bit of a difference. Everybody's used a real-time clock. However, in general, you need to use a lithium cell to back up the time. We're going to take a different approach. This design is going to use a supercapacitor. Why would we go down this path? In schools, you can't use lithium batteries, or at least you can't use removable lithium batteries in electronics because someone could swallow that and that's very dangerous. So there's a couple of ways around that. You can solder a lithium battery in place during the assembly process, but I don't know about you, but if I got, if I got like a, a, a maker electronics module that had a lithium battery soldered in place, I'd think to myself, ah oh man, like I can't, I can't change that battery ever without doing like something potentially destructive. It doesn't, it doesn't really fill you with the positive emotions. So we're going for a super capacitor backed real time clock. That means that when you power it up, it will charge the supercapacitor. The supercapacitor will obviously have a lot less capacity than say a lithium cell. But if you think about the use cases for real-time clocks, that, that's probably okay. They're probably not depowered for more than a couple of days at a time. So here we have the module. It's about 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters, give or take. And you can see that it's dominated by this supercapacitor footprint right in the middle. Up the top, we have the real-time clock. And then just the supporting components, some decoupling caps, pull-up resistors. There's not all that much to a real-time clock circuit. Jumping over to the schematic, we're looking at using the RV3028, which is a one part per million integrated oscillator RTC. It's not temperature compensated, but it's, it's pretty damn good. It's good enough for most applications, I would say. It's a bit of a balancing act with real-time clocks. You can get very affordable ones where you need an external crystal, and then you have to be quite careful in how you design them and how you load those uh, crystals that, that actually run the clock. Then you have integrated oscillators, which are super easy to design around. You don't have to worry about that external crystal. And then on the more expensive end are the temperature compensated units. Those are often you know, quite a bit more expensive. So I think this is probably a good middle ground. And you know, one part per million is nothing to sniff at. Taking a walk around the circuit, this device is intended to be used with a supercapacitor. So we have the standard supercapacitor backup circuit where V backup coming from the RTC just has a little bit of filtering on it and then a charge resistor and your large supercapacitor. Basically every RTC has an interrupt output so that you can set alarms uh, to trigger events. Interestingly, this one can have the interrupt line pulled up to V backup. And that way you can have interrupts fire even when the circuit is depowered, so you can use that as a wake-up condition, say. Might have, to, might have to do some thinking about how we use this. If you were to, if you were to pull up to V backup and this were connected to a depowered microcontroller or a microcontroller in sleep mode, that might actually load the backup capacitance enough to really affect the backup time. We chose this RTC because it has a really low standby current, which is important if you're going to run off a supercapacitor. It can also run down to about, I think, 0.9 volts on the backup line. Now this is the self-discharge curve for the supercapacitor and the real-time clock standby current is about the same as the self-discharge rate. So you can basically take these numbers, halve them, and that's probably a pretty close estimate to how much time you'll get in backup. Now I've spoken at length about how do you test something like this? How do you test a circuit that needs to be battery backed up? So we've included these two jumpers under the super cap so we can pogo pin into that and of course we'll pogo pin onto the main header and that way using our test jig we can sequence a power run, a charge cycle, we can remove power and make sure that power is backed up, repower the circuit, read the time and make sure that the time is still accurate. For something like this the test might take like a handful of seconds like maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds so it makes sense to maybe have a battery of test points so you can test multiple devices in sequence by the time you've loaded up, say, the fourth device under test, the first one should have finished the test. You can remove that one. Just treat the test like a circular buffer. For the jig portion of this week's episode, we've received our OLED soldering jig. 
So Peter has made up two PCB designs, just bare FR4 boards with routed outlines so we can load an OLED module into one compartment, load the board that we want to solder it to in the other, and there's actually provisions for pins to come through that will align the ribbon cable to the board, the flat flex to the board, so everything gets held in place nicely and we come in with our T-bar soldering tip and just solder that whole FFC in one hit. So that's a good trick to keep up your sleeve. If you don't have any machining capabilities in your workshop or if you just need something like fast and cheap and precise, then just getting uncopper clad uh, fiberglass just milled out by a PCB manufacturer is a great way to cheaply make precision fixtures or parts. So we are just that little bit closer to being able to release a Picadev OLED module. We're just waiting on some soldering iron tips in a soldering station, but we're getting, oh, we're getting close. So what we'll be working on for the rest of the week is I have just assembled the prototype Picadev RGB module. We haven't spoken about this one for a long while. It's kind of fallen off the end of the, the to-do list, but I'm excited to just get it done. So I've assembled a few prototypes and we also have the program and test jig arrive so I can laser cut the fixture to go on here so we can program and test Picadev smart modules. So I'll be working on that. Brenton's gonna assemble a real-time clock and Peter is working on extending Picadev buses. We want Picadev to be accessible for you know, installation art as well, not just education, not just like engineering and prototyping, but like we want people to use it in their installation art or in in creative projects. So for that, often you'll probably need a long I squared C bus. Maybe you want to mount your microcontroller somewhere and have like a, a distance sensor much farther away, a couple of meters away so that you can interact with a piece of installation art or a sculpture or something. And for that, you're gonna need long I squared C buses. And so the challenge is this, how do you extend an I squared C bus? There are a couple of options. They do exist some differential amplifiers where you have basically your I squared C bus connected on one end. It goes through a bus translator that converts it to a differential signal. So you can send that over twisted pair cable. And then on the other end, you have the same device again to catch that differential signal and convert it back to I squared C. Really robust, really reliable, not the cheapest device, but unfortunately in this climate, these kind of chips are just not very available. So we have a backup idea. There does exist a low voltage I squared C bus accelerator. And that basically sits on an I squared C bus, just like any other device. And it, it basically acts as a set of active pull up resistors. So an I squared C bus is, is pulled down by devices and pulled up by resistors. And so it's really that pull up resistor that limits the length and speed that the bus can handle. So the idea is this active device basically just sits on a regular I squared C bus and acts as a bus amplifier. So we busted out some adapters and some Ethernet cable just to see how far PicoDev can go at the moment. And I'm pretty pleased to say that we were actually able to drive an OLED module through all of this cable. I don't know, what is this? This might be like something like 10 meters before we needed amplifying. I mean, it's worth mentioning, it's not a very noise hostile environment but it's a pr pretty promising first go. So the next step will be to get some of these chips, connect them to a longer bus and see how far we can stretch it. In any case, that's all I have to update you with this week. If you have any suggestions on what we should work on next, or if you just have some questions, open a thread on the Core Electronics forums. And I'll catch you next time. <laughs>